I must admit that I had never heard of the PDPU till I got an invitation a few months ago. And after that, not only was I curious, but I was keen to be here and uh, see what facilities you have and also to participate in such interactions. Because since my retirement from Tata Steel, which was about three years ago now, I retired at the age of 75, which is too, too long, I think. Uh, I've been trying to connect with as many students as possible, and therefore I was ha I'm happy to be here. In the time that has been given to me, I have found out through experience, because I've given similar talks elsewhere, you can see over here, uh, no, no, don't start it now. Uh, I've got given something like um, maybe 50 different one, talks, and I had to select one of them to talk to you about. And what I have selected is something I think which all of you, being in a management institute, would want to aspire to being, which is the CEO's position. Uh, some of you will no doubt make it, some of you may not. But that doesn't mean that you try, that you don't try. And uh, what I'm going to tell you is not something which is from the pages of uh, management books. Some of them I've re read and most of them I've cast, cast aside. Uh, because ultimately it is the personal experience of the person which is paramount. And I wanted to give you, I can go on for three, four hours, but don't worry, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but because I prefer interactions rather than uh, monologues, I get tired of lis listening to my own voice. So I will speak for what you have said about 30, 35 minutes. And after that, we will take questions, which in my, for me, will be more entertaining. I don't know about you. Uh, this is just to remind me of the time. Um, can we have the... So what, what I, have, I have written down here... Sorry, how do we open? Oh, it's over there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have had a long career in Tata's, over 40 years. And uh, most of my working life has been there. So this is what I wrote down before I stepped down as the CEO and uh, what I thought was necessary for new aspiring CEOs such as yourselves to think about. What do I press? Yeah, sure. Yeah, fine. And then I keep on pressing each one as it comes. This one, okay. um, the first thing you all must do, and you have certainly reached that stage, is you must develop a personal vision. You can change it. I changed mine. My personal vision was to work in R&D. When I was in England, I was fascinated by what is known as the search to find out, you know, knowledge. I was a steel person, so I used to know to, uh, used to work with, shall we say, electron microscopes and so on. What is it that makes steel strong and how you can improve it? And since then, I might add, not because of me, but because of the development of science, the steels have improved many fold. Uh, they're, strong, they're twice as strong, far more reliant. reliant. So my initial in interest in life was to search for the cause of things and uh, based on my knowledge to improve it. That was, my, that was my vision. After I came to India at the invitation of Mr. J.R.D. Tata at that time, I felt that it was not the thing to do in India because we didn't have the necessary facilities or the verve and the vitality to do that. So I switched over to operations and now for the last 35 years, uh, I have devoted myself to operations and for at least a decade I was the CEO. And what I found very important and for young people like you to know is the, what do you want to accomplish in your lives? You must have a plan. 
without a plan you can get confused and you can go astray i can only give you the example i don't know nowadays whether it is uh, the done thing for you all to read or in your childhood a book which i really loved which was called alice in wonderland uh, many many people are nodding so i'm glad that it is still shall we say readable to students in that book at one stage alice comes out of the forest and when she comes out of the forest she says she's three roads in front of her and she asks the cheshire cat which is up in the tree which road do i take and the cat replies where do you want to go alice says i don't know so in that case the cat says you can take any road as long as you keep on walking you are bound to reach somewhere that is not what i would like you all as ceos to do this is something that you have to focus on it might seem a difficult task it might seem far away but you must focus in your life on at this stage particularly as you are coming out of college or undergoing some training and then will come out what do you want to accomplish in your life you can change the target later on like i did but you must have a plan to work on the next thing i would advise the come on here uh the next thing i would advise you to do is to tell the truth about current reality not something which we in india's political life are shall we say very keen to do because we seem to change to change our track every few months and but uh, there is a saying in english that you can fool all people some of the time and few people all the time but you can't fool all people all the time so you are bound to be found out sometime and then the retribution uh, what shall we say sets in so please you steal yourselves and it is not difficult and it is not shall we say uh, uh, something which a burden you have to bear you will feel relieved in fact and you will uh, have a good night's sleep every night like i have uh we, because we have always kept ourselves open and have nothing to hide i remember mr narayan murthy one talk of his i hope he has come to this institute also you must listen to him if you listen to people like me he is far superior and uh, narayan murthy once said that don't do anything which if you see published in tomorrow morning's paper will make you feel embarrassed that is a very good test you must think that i'm what am i am saying now for example what i am saying today if i see it one of you quoting me or see it published i won't be embarrassed because it is the truth so this is something that you have to develop to do tell the truth about current reality as ceo the next point is do the tough things no one else wants to do this in our life i'm i'm afraid once again politicians are not very good examples maybe the present prime minister is an exception and we are looking forward to that but uh, usually people don't do the tough things and leave it on you know particularly in the business world when you know that your tenure is going to be for 3 years or 5 years you don't do the tough things you leave it for the next fellow and then the next fellow leaves it for the next fellow and like that all the important things that need to be done get postponed get delayed and nobody it's uh, you know catches the nettle is a saying in english catching the nettle by in your hand with something which will prick you something which will hurt you but you have to do it don't leave it for the next person and uh, i'm told that one of the american presidents had a, a tablet on his uh, desk uh, which said the buck stops here so this is something which is very very important do the tough things no one else to has to do i have done many of tough things in my life and i'll just quote on one, one of them uh, when i was uh, i went in as ceo 
one of the boys or girls asked me just now, what is the CEO be difference between CEO and president? I said, there is none. It's a matter of nomenclature. So what I had to do at, uh, in the beginning of my career as CEO was I had to reduce the family size of Tata Steel. Over the years, it had, began, it had grown and grown and grown. And when I took it over, it was 80,000. And uh, we knew that if we remained in, in that, uh, shall we say, mold, we will never become a very profitable organization. So I said that, look, uh, I put, got my HRD people to work. Nobody knew the final answer. In fact, when I started, we didn't even know how many people were working in Tata Steel. The family size was not known. It took, took us two months to find out in all the different nooks and corners of Tata Steel with an all-India organization, how many we were, and the figure was over 78,000. So I said, okay, we will go on a year-by-year -year thing. The unions asked me, what is your objective? I said, I'm, I have an annual objective. I will not tell you the f final figure because I don't know it myself. And if I had told them that we would halve the force to 40,000, there would have been a riot. Even if I had told them it would be 20,000 less, there would have been a riot. So I told them we will have an annual target. First year we did 3,000, then we did another five and so on. And I don't have that graph to show you, uh, but we came down to 40,000, almost half of 78,000 over a period of 10 years. 2,000 some, year, some years, 5,000 another year, that sort of thing. And it was a painless transition. And, and what, how I explained to the workers was, that look, we are in an ICU. Everybody knew what an ICU is, intensive care unit in a, in a medical sense. Uh, in Tata Steel, we have these ICUs. And uh, so I told them that we are in an ICU as far as industry is concerned. And if we want to become strong, there are two ways you can do it. One is that you take painful, undertake painful operations, take bitter medicines, stomach these out, and then one day you will be able to walk out on your, four, on your own two legs vertically out of the ICU. Then you can say that I'm strong again. The other way to get out of the ICU is to say, oh, I won't, do it. I won't undertake pain, I won't take bitter medicines, God will look after me, and God will and you will go after a few, a few months or years horizontally straight to the burning heart. So these are two ways of getting out of the ICU. Luckily, our union leaders got the message. I used to give them many stories. You know, people respond to stories in India. We have now we have the Navratri festival. That also, in a way, is recounting stories. So in, in India, the population does believe in a little bit of storytelling. So. I got that through, and uh, it was, but it was a very painful exercise. I remember one day, <clears throat> my little daughter, who was in her early teens that time, maybe 12 or 13, came back from school crying. And I asked her, what was it? He said, Dad, you sacked my best friend's father. I will not, I will not uh, shall we say, uh, uh, forgive you for that. And I had to take, spend the whole evening explaining to her, only a 12 or 13 year old, what that meant and uh, how her best friend's father would not in a way suffer. They would be given a very fair uh, parting gift. And uh, what, what we had done in Tata Steel was that we had a separation scheme where we selected the person, not those people could apply for it. We selected the person on various criteria and uh, you know uh, offered them this plan when i say offered them they really had no choice uh, they, they had to take it but uh, but it was euphemistically called an offer and and then after a year or two they all thanked me for it because it was such a generous offer the ge offer i will not go through but it was very generous and it was very successful and out of the 40000 people who left in that decade 10,000 would have gone anyway through natural retirement, having reached the age, getting transferred, dying, all that sort of thing. 10,000. Uh, 
the remaining 30,000 took this uh, formula, which is still in application. And it gave, us, gave them a very good, shall we say, pension for life, and they were, they were free to do anything else that they wanted. One of my friends in Bombay, in the business world, when he learned that this was such a success, he wrote to me and said, what is your plan? I want to know about it. So I sent him the plan. One week later, he said, under the, my, the, uh, under, under the advice of my HRD department, I have to reject your plan. You either have too much money or too little brains. But I can tell you that there is a book which has been published recently, I don't have a copy here, uh, which uh, the Fortune, uh, Fortune Group has taken out on international. It uh, figures people like Rockefeller, Bill Gates, everyone saying 20 decisions which changed the world. And I'm very proud to say that the decision of Tata Steel is one of them. So, <clears throat> so ultimately, ultimately we won, even though to start off, it looked to be a very horrific decision, which made my daughter cry and made me feel very sorry. The next one is restructure the top team if necessary. Oh, sorry, I press press here. Um, that word, if necessary, is very important. It doesn't mean that when you become a CEO, you go with a hatchet and start chopping off heads. You have to first consider whether it is necessary to do so. Very often it is necessary. I look upon the restructuring uh, exercise, you know, when you, as, as a ship in dry, dry dock, let me explain what, uh, what I mean. Uh, when you launch a new ship into the sea, uh, it is beautifully painted, clean and so on. Over the years, it starts developing barnacles, small, uh, small shall we say, even uh, vegetation on the hull. And after some years, it becomes quite unwieldy because it has developed all those uh, uh, additional weights and additional corrosion problems. And you have to take it to dry dock and scrub all that away and you paint it again and then you relaunch it. This exercise is exactly the same. The Tata Steel which was there for formed in 1906 I think it was and it has now gone over a century has gone many such restructuring programs but not none, none so shall we say uh, distinctive as the last one which we did in the 1990s. We are still a 40,000 company, making two, three times as much steel as we made before, obviously far more efficiently. And at one time, no longer now, but at one time, we were the lowest cost producer of steel in the world. There are some newer plants now which have taken that distinction away from us, but we are still very efficient and still very proud of what we have done and what we will continue to do in future. So restructuring of the t uh, top team becomes, becomes very important. The next thing is build a powerful coalition management and board. Um, this I'm sure you learn in management teams. Somebody asked me what is the difference between a president and a CEO and there is really none. The CEO is only the, uh, the president we need not be on the board and the CEO has to be on the board. And uh, you know there was a restriction for uh, management uh, remunerations, no, so, no longer now, but in the 1980s it was very prominent. So one day Mr. J.R.D. Tata called me to his office and said, Jamshed, why do you want to in remain on the board of the company officially? Uh, because if you're on the board, I have to go by the regulations and pay you at that time maximum of 10,000 rupees a month. But if you become, if you step off the board and become a president, you'll still have the same powers. You'll still attend all board meetings. You'll, you'll still come and try to convince us or fool us at board meetings. But uh, you will be called president, you will not be on the board and then I can pay you anything that you want. That's not what I want, but what I think is reasonable. I said, fine. 
So I became president for five years and then the government restriction went, so I went back as CEO. So I became, was, I was an MD, president and then again uh, uh, managing director.